should be live in a moment. And I think we're live. All right. Yay. Good evening, everybody. If you are uh, watching us live, uh, this is the Prague Piano webcast. This is the fourth edition, the last edition of the weird year of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> we will continue, of course, in 2021. And uh, I'm here with uh, Jie Chang, of course, uh, who will be commentating this discussion with uh, uh, our friend and uh, we go way back, actually, Elena Chalakova, who is, uh, uh, who, who is a great pianist, a uh, great teacher. Uh, she's currently the director of piano studies at M Emory University in Atlanta, which is, I think, where she is right now. Uh, and we'll be talking about uh, about many things again. So if you are if you're live, you know, and if you want to ask questions, we have the chat box. Mm, uh, I will be monitoring that dur during the discussion. So please uh, ask your questions. I will try to get uh, to them uh, as soon as we can. We have some recordings as well. So the format will be pretty much similar to what we did last time. So. Uh, Elena, how are you doing during the pandemic? Um, well, better as it's gone, which is strange to say, but I'm sure as both of you have adjusted to this new reality of living and creating and being, um, it was certainly difficult at the beginning because, you know, all of a sudden everything that we used to know just didn't exist anymore. And we had to find a new meaning to be um, in the sense of, um, you know, we're so used to having performances and something to drive us to practice and to create and to look forward to new projects. And, you know, all of a sudden we had to find a way to continue to do so in a new reality. But I think we have all assimilated this new reality by now and we found meaningful ways to, to to continue to do what we do right like this you know who would have thought that we would be doing something like this to talk to our friends right <laughs> that's true you know and i was actually you know thinking that you know musicians especially those of us you know who really started you know as freelance artists you know we kind of do have this ability to adapt you know, mm -hmm. that's something that, you know, we had to learn to survive, you know, in the in the field, you know, so maybe, maybe we do have this, this advantage, you know, over people, you know, who have been maybe like part of certain institution for a long time and really don't know any other world. And suddenly they don't have that certainty anymore. And, right. you know, everything, everything disappears. Uh, so maybe uh, what we always do, we always ask our guests uh, about their background, about their musical background. And of course, uh, yours is very interesting because you're originally from Bulgaria. Uh, you did all your all your uh, university degrees in the U.S., correct? Uh, so maybe maybe if you can walk us through this a little bit, you know, tell us a little bit about how was it growing up uh, in Bulgaria? Uh, how was you know how was how was your musical education there? And when you went to the U.S., how did things change for you? Your perspective, you know, your kind of attitudes to music, things things like that. Right, especially if I may add, um, when you were a little kid, when you just began, what did you practice? method book wise like etudes and stuff like that what was mandatory or expected yeah um yeah it's it's interesting that um the books that i practice as a child are quite different from what we have as method books here in the united states but but i actually found a website i should have um I should have found a way to share this with you all, where they sell those books that I learned as a kid. Really? It was something like a rare Russian course. It was something along those lines. Ah. But they do exist, apparently. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Bulgaria. Um, it's interesting in a way because I feel, you know, much in the sense of the the way the government and the country was run back then, they choose you to do whatever they think you're good at, and you don't necessarily choose this. Um, so you have basically not much saying when you're young what you want to do. And that's basically all you focus on. So unlike what my kids do now here in the United States, they grow up doing sports, 
maybe they play some piano whether they want it or not and then you know do math other things that was not necessarily how i was brought up or probably both of you it was probably a similar way so you they give you one thing you focus on and you better be good at it because otherwise the system will right out <laughs> but how do they know if you how do they decide what to give you well um i suppose um you have a choice to go to a regular school or you have a choice at a young age to try out for a specialized school okay so um you know my parents started me on piano and then you have auditions for uh -huh. first so then they do ear, which is very interesting, something ear training has huge emphasis mm. in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. So every time you audition with piano and you audition first grade, third grade and seventh grade to stay in oh. the school, they, they they have a big exam on ear training. So they, I feel they firmly wow. believe if you have a good ear, if they can train your ear, they'll make you a decent pianist. So, and I, I still probably strongly be believe in that, you know, if uh -huh. you hear something, you could, you could play it, right? Even um, without as much, maybe work sometimes, I, I suppose, some people are lucky like that they can probably reproduce something that their teacher plays for them. So yeah, I grew up in that, but the 90s were a very difficult time in Eastern Europe, so there was no, conversations of becoming a pianist with my parents and staying in Bulgaria whatsoever. So they insisted that I learn a language. And um, there was no path of staying in the Sofia Conservatory, really, although I love my professor there. And I would have loved to stay and continue to study with him. But, you know, because I knew English, I you know, I sent my recordings to the one place where people had gone before me, mm -hmm. the University of Central Arkansas. And the professor there had one full scholarship to give every year. And we would fight for that scholarship. <laughs> and, you know, we basically didn't know where we we're going. So he would always choose one pianist from my high school. And then I went and I took TOEFL and that's the first time I ever used a computer and a mouse. <laughs> so I did the training that they give you. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> How to <keep> it. <laughs> it was unusual times. And then that's really it. Next thing I knew, I was in Conway, Arkansas. So was the teacher Bulgarian? I mean, did he have a connection with Bulgaria or? I still do not know how that connection yeah, happened. Yeah, that's interesting. It, he had he he gave that scholarship to one student from my high school at the time yeah you know it's interesting because my high school had a lot of now looking back uh, Jose Fregalia was there at my high school a bunch of other pianists like now that I know who they are like looking back they would come and give master classes and often recruit so I think it was a pretty good upbringing in that sense. They, oh. our teachers cared, you know, they wanted yeah. to make something out of us. But it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a sad um, story because the people who stayed musicians, who st stuck with the profession, they all left. So that generation is sort of gone, you know. Right. Oh, well. Mm. And then here in the United States, you know, um, I did not get along with that teacher very much that helped me get to the United States. So I look for all sorts of ways to leave Arkansas. And mm. Arkansas is not necessarily where a musician, classical musician wants to be, in all honesty. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to be, but not as much happening in terms of concerts, in terms of, you know, just life as it is and um i moved to atlanta and i finished my bachelor here and then i auditioned everywhere and i was looking for a full scholarship again you know it's it just wasn't possible so next place that i found myself was northwestern and i did my master's there and then i i really wanted to stay for my dma and 
I was lucky enough that I got into the program because actually now um, it's impossible. It's kind of like the Olympics. The level is just obscenely high. I think every year they, the, the pianists that audition are better and better, but it's, it was really, it was really, you know, the all stars aligned and somehow, you know, I made it through <laughs> all my degrees. <laughs> With a lot of work, of course, but also some luck. I, I, I don't. I have no doubt about that. Mm. So I'm just curious, you know, because you you talked, you know, about your upbringing. How much do you think you draw on all of that you have learned when you were a child? Now, how how much do you think your musical upbringing in Bulgaria Bulgaria really defines you as a pianist now? Mm. Or do you think of you know be, having been you know in the U.S. for a really really long time, you have sort of sort of you know become part of you know that that landscape? I have to say, I think that was part of the reason why I just did not get along with my first teacher in the United States. Mm-hmm. I um, I think I just stuck to that upbringing so much about everything that I did. Um, in, in particular, what I'm just curious. Right, what... me too. <laughs> um, well, I, I, everything. To me, back then, that's, oh my God, 20 years ago. So number one was not perfect. That was the most important thing to me. And then I thought then the, the phrasing and the, the everything else came secondary. And I think he had a different perspective. And I think that a more mature me, <laughs> older me, maybe would have understood that. But back then, I just thought I was great. It's like how I sounded like <laughs> Like, what was he talking about? <laughs> um, so I, um, in that sense, I think I did change a lot. So now I don't see myself as a product necessarily of what, the way I was brought up. I really think the way I listen, the way I play, the way I teach is really what I've learned here. A, a big sense of it. Not necessarily what I assign, because I always... Mm. I try to stay away from, I mean, of course, I will assign the pieces that everybody, you know, has to study, but I try to look for repertoire that's not as well known here, or is not as well played, or it's not approached at a certain age. So like I try, I still find inspiration, I still find pieces that I knew as a younger pianist. Mm -hmm. So you don't really rely too much. Uh, maybe that's a question for later, but uh, we I could ask you right now. You don't rely on method books as much. Method books for younger pianists? Yeah. I really don't believe in them. Yeah. Me neither. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really what's the ultimate goal. You know, yeah. if the goal is for a child to take it easy and, you know, learn as little as possible maybe that's that's the way to go i mean not as little as possible but rather to to learn to stay in lessons i should say if that's the goal maybe method books are a good idea but if if the goal is to give somebody a chance i think they are detrimental to everything that we teach as pianists and musicians right you know and and very often in the method books you know the, the the music is so bad right and it takes forever to do anything i think mm-hmm. that bothers me the most the pacing is just like mm-hmm. everybody's like a turtle and mm-hmm. i just yeah but anyways and it's, but, always, it's always the same composers it's always favorite yeah there are more it's than... different composers they just sound like the same composer but <laughs> <laughs> <There's that. laughs> it's funny um i have a student from china who's six seven and she when i give her something from cherny or bach or anything and she would say you know i have to say something that is really good it's a little more difficult but i like it better something oh. along that line and i'm like mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it takes more work but it's good and i'm glad you find it that way so yeah i think every student understands that it's so much more rewarding to learn something that you have to work a little bit more for harder yeah right but then it also you take really more pride playing that piece for sure that's right yeah, yeah. are we gonna listen to something because i, I want to ask 
I yeah. think we should play something. I think uh, so. Maybe maybe we could start with the Beethoven. This yeah. being a Beethoven year and all, and right? and, and, and yeah, and Elena <laughs> sent sent send a wonderful re recording of Beethoven's Waldstein Sonata, and uh, we agreed that maybe listening to the last movement would be. Would yeah, be I best. think this at uh, this hour the last movement is probably best for <laughs> So we're going to do that. Let me know if I need to share it. You know. You want me to? Just my screen froze for some reason. Can you? Yeah. Can you find it? Yeah. I have the recording as well on downloaded on my computer, so I can mm. play directly from my computer. Yeah, I do have it set up. Do you remember? Oh, no. I think it's like one thirty-one something around okay. there. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So we'll start at the end of the second movement. One thirty. I'm sorry, one thirty-two maybe, around that area.
So that was our guest, uh, Natyalakova, in a brilliant performance, <laughs> the performance of the last movement of the Weinstein Sonata. Uh, That's and the I, first time I heard you play, Elena, actually. Bravo. Oh, okay. <laughs> love your sound. It's so beautiful. And just the sound quality. I love it. Even just through, you know, computer, through computer recorded version. Yeah, so great to hear you play. Yeah, thanks. This was, um, you know, like, so all year we had planned basically everything Beethoven and we planned all his sonatas to be done in two week, two long weekends. Mm -hmm. So it was just nonstop, nonstop, you know, like basically Saturday, Sunday, all of his sonatas and then the following weekends, the same thing to finish off. So this was the last concert that I played live. <laughs> it's sort of sad to think about it, but the year before that, we went to New York to purchase that piano, mm -hmm. the brand new piano. And all year, basically, you know, like we're saving it for this moment where yeah. we're going to play all of Beethoven's sonatas. So um, maybe I played at one concert and maybe a guest played at once. That's it. Literally brand new piano. So right before I'm supposed to play on stage, the pedal breaks. <laughs> true story <laughs> the damper pedal broke so all these pianists that are backstage there was a picture of us on stage under the piano trying to fix it mm -hmm. so, <laughs> it became quite the story i think also the atlanta journal constitution put the picture because it was just incredible so but the whole time i was playing i was just thinking something's gonna happen to that pedal again <laughs> I made it. I made it. So I think, and then the technician came. So it's, and, and since then, I don't think anybody has played this piano either. So it's, oh, man. it's, it's awaiting better times. Mm. No, but just looking at the performance and tying back to what David was asking, how much of what you learned in Bulgaria shapes you as a pianist or as a teacher? And then I'm thinking about myself, you know, what I am as a pianist, how I play. And there were a couple influential teachers, sorry, <laughs> my kid running around, but um, later on in my life. But I think if I'm pressed for time or just in an emergency kind of situation, I, I think my old old habits come up out. And I'm trying to figure out because, you know, nobody told me how to play the piano. And we talked about it with Lisa last week about some, something about the arm, you know, the arm weight and how to relax and use your arm kind of thing. I don't think that is actually discussed a lot in Korea. Korean technique is much more about fingers. It's, it's very, very finger, finger oriented. So I had fast fingers very even, like kind of playing, you know, but I don't think the focus was much on this relaxed arm or beautiful tone or anything. And so I'm thinking, you know, if I had to learn this quickly and put on the stage, I'm going to sound a little bit more, I don't know, I don't want to say aggressive, but mm -hmm. it's going to be different. Do, do you know what I'm saying? So it, it just comes back mm -hmm. without me intending to play like that because I learned many great new things later on but so was there an emphasis in Bulgaria also about you know how to use fingers or more arm anything you can share I, I don't I think there was emphasis from what I remember from my teacher and Sofia about tone quality it was okay. he really cared about tone quality so he, he was trained in uh, Moscow so that was always first and forthcoming with him. I don't think he cared how many right or wrong notes I played. I mean, he probably cared. <laughs> that was never the case. Like he would never speak about, oh, you missed two notes. Mm -hmm. Practice. He would always speak about the depth of the sound ah. and yada, yada. And <laughs> he would always <laughs> tell me, <laughs> okay, he had a rabbit at his <laughs> apartment in Sofia. And he would comment how the rabbit feels. <laughs> <laughs> About your playing. Played. <laughs> Maybe that's more than I know. Maybe it's ah, a interesting. situation. 
Mm. Anyways, but I before that, I just always remember, you know, that thing about relaxation, arm movement, that's very foreign. I just never knew that. And I remember growing up, I would struggle like playing Chopin etudes. I would get so tired right in the middle of it. I would be like, ah, my hand is going to fall off. And the only way I knew how to overcome that is just put in more hours, right? Put in more, videos, <laughs> yeah. more rhythms. Come up with all sorts of things. That sounds more like Korean. Yes, yes. Right? That's how I remember. <laughs> right. And eventually, it's amazing. Eventually, like it works. But the right. kind and you figure work, out how, yeah. <laughs> right. The kind of work you do, you're just basically like a, just coal mining through the Chopin, <laughs> right? until you you can play it and right. now now you know when i teach i you know i'm sympathetic towards them and but so but sometimes i just want to say you know you just sometimes you just like have to suffer through it yourself and <laughs> best for you like you know clearly i try to help but like sometimes the things that you discover on your own are priceless because then you're very true yeah that's really true you know and i was actually thinking also you know uh, hearing you play because of course you know you have you have great fingers but i feel also that you have really great coordination you know mm. so so it just makes me feel like you know you really have the of course the, the rotation you know and the free fall so i can also like see you know how your fingers connect you know to your arm mm -hmm. and which is not uh, again you know some people really focus too much you know on, on the fingers but i was thinking it's really interesting what you said you know about suffering through practicing you know and you can <laughs> discover things you know on, on your on your own and i think that's that's very different from the experience of many of my students for example or you know lots of students you know in general some sometimes they come for a lesson and they want to problem solve right mm -hmm. they ask you okay uh this is not working teach me how to do it <laughs> and sometimes okay. it feels like well you know this you would tell them okay so this is going to take three three years of mm -hmm. eight hours of practice a, a, right. a day you know and and the problem is that you know each one of us has a different hand and each one of mm -hmm. us has a, has a little different mechanism and right. we do arrive at the at the conclusions differently you know so sometimes just you know there are no there's no blueprint for for, for something right so, you know but but i but i do think you know that the sort of you know the the long hours that that you that you mentioned that kind of you know i did also you know because i was very compulsive you know i would practice 10 12 hours a day easily you know and and sometimes i i'm sure that my practicing was probably horrible you know in terms of in terms of intensity in terms of what i've learned you know but but i did build the muscles so i feel like kind of you know what, what jihei was saying that you know sometimes when you are in this moment of panic when you need to learn something <laughs> quickly and when just something happens this always kicks in <laughs> yeah, the old mechanism. Yeah, yes, because I yeah. spent most hours during those formative years. Mm -hmm. So I think that's my default kind of setting that I go yeah. back to. But again, you know, back to what you were saying, you figured it out on your own. I think that was a lot of what I did because my teacher would either tell me, make it prettier or, <laughs> you know, make it faster, more yeah. even. And yeah. I had to figure out how to do that. And somehow, I I did it, yeah. and you guys are crazy. Eight and twelve hours. I never did that. I think I did six hours maximum. But <laughs> anywho, well, maybe you practice smart. You know, yeah, she's she smarter than us. <laughs> I had one summer where I distinctly remember I was in Italy. I did twelve hours for about. Oh my god! <laughs> but I was I was going insane. I was mm -hmm. I was just, because I think I was auditioning for a masters or something. Mm -hmm. but, I think maybe David gets the gold medal for like obsessing and practicing. But then also, you know, it, just, it just felt really good, you know. I mean, just the, just the process. Yeah, of the, you the like work. pain. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but I do remember. So I didn't put out that many hours, but I had my methods, my own things that I invented. You know, I would wake up in the morning, play through something, and just do it five times in a row. See how many of them I get really well. Mm. Or, you know, how am I going to warm up my hands if there is no piano, things like that. So in that way, I think it, it's good that I figure those things out on my own. But then at the same time, looking at some students these days, like, like David was saying, I have to tell them everything. And sometimes I just wish that they would do just a little bit more, you know, just more hours, more thinking and... I find also the younger generation is smarter than us. 
They and should be, right? They, they're supposed to be smarter. But, and sometimes I feel like what I accomplish with more hours, it takes them less. And also I feel oh, there's maybe. more confidence somehow. I feel like I had to fight through a lot of demons that I'm not good enough. I'm never be as good as somebody Ooh. or, um, you know, my playing like lacks this and that. And like a lot of that is, was instilled because it's, you know, they, it's the teaching is just negative you know it's just always like not nah. what's wrong mm. yeah yeah we, we, we talked about this last time yeah. oh did you okay <laughs> so, this the East european teaching right, there was a, right. There was you never hear a good word right yeah. so like at some point it sort of gets to you and it doesn't matter how much okay. you, like you think that okay they're just trying to help me well first of all i don't even know if that's what i thought i just mm. it's just like you're growing up thinking you're not good and whereas, you know, you're decent, I think, right? At least decent as a pianist when you're younger and practicing and doing well. And I think that's something that I don't, I don't have to do with my own students. Like, you know, they know I'm in their corner. So mm. at least that's out of the equation. So I feel like sometimes, because they do more than what I did, like they do mm. sciences, they do, I don't know, like Olympiads, what not that I can't even wrap my mind around. And on top of that, they ace SAT and ACT and you name it, all of the above. So um, to be able to do all that and play well, I mean, that takes intelligence, right? And if you don't have those hours to... Those are special students, though, I think. So then I think that leads to our mm. other questions that we wanted to ask you. How do you get those amazing students who, who are so smart and also play great because i've met some of some of your students at music festivals and master classes and they are really amazing so yeah i'm so lucky honestly i feel like um it's just been such a blessing just mm -hmm. to have them in my life all of them my younger students my emory students i don't have one student who i haven't really enjoyed teaching or the ones that I did we just part ways but yeah <laughs> it's it's been really I mean truly it's inspirational to see them grow and like become the people they become sometimes I get really surprised sometimes you know I feel okay maybe we could have done more together but sometimes I don't even anticipate as much growth like as what I see you know or like people as you mature, you start feeling different about music. Sometimes you grow up thinking you're going to use it as a vehicle to get you somewhere. And then it, mean, it starts to mean more to mm -hmm. you. And then you, you accomplish more than you ever thought you will. And that, again, that's both my college and my, some of my private students. It's, it's really, truly amazing to have them in my life. Yeah. I don't know how I, they, they find me. I don't know. It, <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> Every well, because because you're a great teacher, you know, and <laughs> once yeah. you have a few, you know, more more of them come. But you know, I was I was just thinking about it because I met a, a few of your students uh, way back, actually, you know, and I was I was thinking, well, first of all, oh, you know, this is such great teaching, and secondly, you know, it must be really nice to get to these students when they're young, because because very often, you know, when I when I see students, I mean, I have a few private students, but mostly I, really, I teach college, college level students and when they come with baggage when they come with problems things are so so much difficult to fix mm. and i always think oh my goodness you know if i could see these people when they were 12 or 14 mm. you know things could have been really different you know mm. so so i'm just maybe we, we could go back a little bit because of the, that's something you know my, actually my, my students asked me when i was telling them about about this about this this podcast so, so they're asking so how did she build a studio how right. do you actually? Uh, how do you actually? Uh, so, so you went. You, so you finish in Chicago. You finish your your doctorate, and then then you moved to Atlanta. I moved to Atlanta because my husband was right. working in his MBA at Emory, so it was. And you already you already had some musical connections because you you were there before, or not really? Not really. I didn't have any musical connections here. Like I started practicing at Emory because I they had grand pianos and I didn't, and I. Was, <laughs> hogging the practice rooms basically all the time and then it's really everything happened by chance they heard me i mean like clearly if i'm practicing there all the time um somebody's gonna open the door and see like who's the who are you yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. so then at some point they needed somebody to do some collaborative work 
teaching and one thing led to another in terms of memory. But in terms of my private students, maybe I had one or two. Mm. And like I really trained them hard. <laughs> <laughs> And they won a few competitions here and there. And then, you know, then people are starting to want to win competitions. It's all about competitions here in Georgia, at least. I feel like it's driving the piano world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where, I'm, where I live, I'm blessed to have great students. And they're driven, they're talented, they're dedicated. So basically, yeah, one student left to another. And at some point, I had a lot of younger, talented pre-college students. That's before I had my own kids. And mm -hmm. then things changed a little bit. But, um, you know, I still, if I meet somebody who's talented, I mean, it's such excitement. You know, it's hard to say no to a talented younger student. Right. Because as David mentioned, the possibilities are endless, mm -hmm. for sure as long as they're willing to work. I mean, clearly now it's a little more difficult with teaching in a virtual reality, but that's not going to last forever. Mm. This will be back normal, hopefully sooner rather than later. Mm. So but then you... the very first, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I... Yeah. Mm -hmm. The very first one or two students, how did you find them? Were they Americans, Bulgarians, Asians? One was a uh, beautiful Korean pianist. Uh -huh. Um, and she was like a rough diamond that's never been polished, you know, like yeah. so much talent in this girl and like, and, you know, it was, it was easy to teach her. Mm. Mm -hmm. so, and the other one was a daughter of a friend. So like both of them, I, I was like, you will have to practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. They did well. So yeah, that's I guess. It. Yeah. Or, so when you're uh, when you're teaching lessons, you know how specific you are, uh, because I know some students, of course, are driven and they kind of practice on their own. But you know, do you give uh, especially to like, yeah, younger kids? Do you give specific assignments? You'll practice that many hours. You'll do X Y Z every day, <laughs> or so I usually don't have to do that because the parent will sit and do it for me. Mm. But usually, you know, I think it's super important the repertoire you assign. I feel. Mm. Um, you should always assign repertoire that is a little bit and a lot more difficult than one can play at the moment. And um, I, so I always like to a younger student, I will assign all the scales, like they'll have to play them daily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds a little crazy, but I ask that and they do it. So then they'll have at least two etudes, like they'll play Czerny, Moszkowski, they'll play Moschles or like Behrens and always Bach. And then they'll always have like, depending when there are, Sonatina, Sonata and like some other piece. So like that ends up to be a lot of hours. Like mm -hmm. if you're going to do this well and you're going to do it correctly, that ends up being tons of work to practice, right? And they're serious enough that they do it. You know, and I think sometimes, um, like at least I see it sometimes here in Georgia, teachers would skip the steps of the etudes and the Bach because it's so much more fun. To Not teach. only in Georgia. <laughs> okay, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's more, and they think that in the long term, like you can only like practice two, three pieces and you're going to go and like do so well at those competitions, right? But it really what happens, maybe you'll do well for two years and then you'll tank mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. nothing's really developing, right? So right. if you're going to do this right, there's only one path to follow and that's the one with the endless hours. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's great that they follow what you present like that because not everybody will go for that and then you know oftentimes i think actually what you mean is you give them a lot of work right not necessarily like piece that is too hard for them because that i've seen too many times like in competitions and auditions like why are you playing faulstein when you can't probably play haydn right stuff, mm -hmm. right so it's great that they followed what you ask them to do because I do believe you really need to work on all of those things scales fugues arpeggios and sure. you know etudes and basic sonatas and stuff and 
I see just not thorough education mm -hmm. and just focusing on something that is too hard in right. the wrong way for a year. And right. Like, what, what do you learn in that kind of situation? Yeah. Sure. But yeah. Then also, some yeah. students respond better when you present them just a little bit more work, right? Than they might enjoy doing. Yeah. Like back to that seven-year-old Chinese student, their her parents are crazier than me. So, you know, and then she's playing like seven or eight scales really, really beautifully. And then she knows how to play all the chords. And you know, I'm giving her just a little bit more, I think, than a lot of six-year, seven-year-old can handle, but she can. And so, it. I think you are probably very good at gauging with the students and also interacting with the parents and probably a little bit of luck. But I think it's what you build. With, some are just better at that, I think. The, 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 the parents need to be on your side. There's yeah. nothing mm -hmm. unless they are on your side. And I think that, you know, you know, as parents, both of you are, when you see progress, like mm -hmm. you put right. more to whatever your child is doing. Yeah. Well, I think we should listen to one of your students since we are talking about students. So right. maybe, maybe, you, maybe you can yeah. introduce him and uh, tell us a little, yeah. bit, little bit about him. Well, um, you asked for one of my younger students. <laughs> so like if any of my Emory students are watching, you guys are great. <laughs> I had to choose somebody who is a little bit younger. Um, so this is Charlene Kuhn. You know, it's it's such a special special boy. Um, yes, she had known him because he was at Brevard with her as well. So it was such a joy to teach him. Just what a nice boy too! Like not only a great musician and pianist, but just great person. So for sure. So he is one who you know I met him five years ago, and you know, I think looking back, I was kind of mean to him at the beginning. <laughs> Are you? But I think it was because I knew he has so much potential. Like I could really see it in him and, and he's really adaptable and like he can change things and like he wants to be better and he, he can make changes on the spot, which is like super important quality. Yeah. So this, um, like what I sent you is uh, the last move in the Prokofiev eighth sonata, which, <laughs> you know, when I gave it to him, he was like, are you sure? <laughs> talked about it for a little while and um so the the i think to me the first movement is a beast so like i would never assign it to mm. anybody that young but the the last one's doable it's you know it's it, it it moves along um so he's playing um the last movement of Prokofiev is not in the so listen a little bit of that
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Nada is so difficult. Yeah, and he did amazing and he's grown. He's grown. You yeah. know? He's even better now. This is from he, this year, he couldn't really record because of the pandemic. But, you know, I, I've played that long, long. Any No, come on. So I remember that last page. I don't know if you guys play that piece. No. That page is absurd. <laughs> it's so much worse than the seventh. <laughs> seventh is doable. The precipitato. This like it's just. Anyways. Yeah. I want to ask you a little bit more about about repertoire, actually, about uh, music that uh, you're close to or stylistically. You know, if you feel like, you know, if it's really romantic music and mm -hmm. you know early 20th century music, is that where you feel strongest? Is that where you kind of? Um, you know, I feel like that's also changing and I, I'm actually glad it's changing because it would be kind of sad to live your life in one era, you know, or pressing, you know, like for a while I obsessed over Liszt so much. It was, ah. and then, but then before that I obsessed over Chopin and then like I wrote my dissertation on that and like it was all about Chopin. And now... It was on the preludes, correct? Right, the, yeah, yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. So, um... Now I feel like I've moved on and I am my next project when this is over is I mean even now I'm commissioning female composers mm -hmm. to follow CD. So I I'm really interested in the nowadays. I feel like this year if has has taught us anything, it's not just the pandemic, it's just you know the racial injustice that has to be put to an end. So I feel like we as musicians have such an obligation to do that, you know, in whichever way we can. So um, my next project is just to find these women, female composers, you know, and of all backgrounds of all, you know, um, around the world and, you know, bring their work to life. And I think, um, that's something that I'm hoping to complete, maybe hopefully in the next, it was supposed to be two years, but now who knows <laughs> when, when we unfreeze grants, maybe right. it's point. Right. hopefully sooner rather than later. And I think um, in terms of teaching, I feel like now I've played and I've taught repertoire, like the standard repertoire. So I don't feel uncomfortable, but I am mm -hmm. looking forward to learning more about, you know, this, this type of music more that mm. Gina probably that's her forte because she plays so no much. <laughs> i actually never played pokofiev sonatas i played his concertos oh sonatas. more difficult <laughs> right. it's kind of lacking in a weird way but um yeah, i would love to learn some of his sonatas before it's too late you know mm. <laughs> memorizing has become a little mm. bit slow for me mm. learning is quick because I think we are more experienced and we know how to go about things better. But yeah, memorizing, I was just thinking as I'm listening to Charlie, like how, how, how many notes and how do you, how do you do this? But yeah. Yeah, I know. yeah I, I, because I was, I was curious when I asked you about, about uh, composers, about styles, you know, because whenever I hear your students play, you know, they have such a very clear idea of, what Bach is and what Beethoven is, you know, even even when they when they're younger and you know still struggling, you know, I think you know, there's a sort of like intelligence that I think you help them to acquire. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of again kind of going back with me, you know, to your to your upbringing. Uh, how uh, how much have you really learned about stylistic differences between composers? You know, because uh, as you know, we, I think you you and I we kind of you know both come from that Russian tradition a little bit and. Uh, in that Russian tradition, sometimes everything can sound a little bit the same. It's everything is very beautiful, but everything is a little bit the same, <laughs> right? So articulation in Bach, for example, right? You know, we always went with the long slurs and um, a lot of pedal, and yeah, it just sounded awesome, but it was so uh -huh. so wrong. Still awesome though. Uh, <laughs> so so I'm just I'm just you know thinking you know how much you know have you changed your attitude you know coming to the states you know and of course you know started playing from urtext editions you know because that's also something we really didn't have you know when we when we mm. were growing up mm -hmm. so do you feel like you know you know more about about, about things now or how much you know how much what you learned you know as, as a child still kind of you know creeps you know into that or have you kind of moved on mm. right now 
it's funny you mentioned Urtex because probably you did the same thing. You know, I'll go to the library and if I'm lucky, there's one book that I can photocopy and that was legal. And that's the only way, you know, we acquired scores, that's it. But now I think as a, you know, more mature pianist and musician now, I read the score better, like way better, you know, it used to be the case, you know, like I would, um, my teachers would say something when I was in Bulgaria, like, so in the score, and I'll be like, sure. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening, right? And, but now, you know, as you get older and <laughs> wiser, <laughs> um, you understand, right? You understand the slurs, you understand articulation. And I, to me, I feel like um, rhythm is super vital, super important. Like a lot of things start with rhythm. And I think if you have a good understanding and um, you, you, you like stick to the rhythm and you do it well, I think a lot of things sort of fall in place. And uh, I mean, clearly that's very true for the classical era, but really any, you know, because even if you're playing rubato, it has to do with rhythm. Right. How you choose, like the tools you use, it really falls down on that. So I think maybe a lot of the decisions I make and recommendations stem from that. Can I ask about, one last question? I'm oh, sorry. No, what about? You go ahead. I'm thinking about classical repertoire, particularly I mean, uh, Haydn, Haydn, Mozart, Mozart, Beethoven, you know, and especially because, again, uh, I remember really learning from scores that were not always, not always very, very good. Mm. Bach, you know, obviously, you know, I was just so surprised, you know, when I opened, you know, Bach or text editions and realized actually the slurs are not I'm, there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it and it really and I still remember that moment, you know, that sort of the kind of moment of clarity. I realized, mm -hmm. oh, actually, this could sound very, very different. Uh, doesn't mean that you know I'll, I'll stop, you know, doing everything I have been doing in the past. You know, but but it really changed my attitude. And mm -hmm. so uh, and I feel like you know you, uh, when I when I listen to Charlie and kind of you know your your kids, you know, they have so much you know clarity in the fingers, and it seems like you know you do teach articulation and how much time do you spend on that actually like you know showing them showing them phrase structure you know showing the slurs you know how much do you think they really understand it and how much do you think it's just talent mm -hmm. well i think it's helpful if you can demonstrate of course so oh. like if you have a talent it's still they'll pick up right away uh -huh, mm -hmm. right so, um, I mean, it's, there's a danger to that as well. So you don't want to overdo it because like, if they're really good, they'll just copy you. Right. And then that's very dangerous as well, but at least, you know, like to relate the idea. So if you demonstrate a little bit, I think that sort of gets the message across and then intelligence and talent does the rest of the work and then reflects them for sure. Right. right. So then my last question actually is to both of you and to myself as well. So, you know, the year is ending and you are talking about the project you hope to do in the next two, three years. And, you know, how have you guys just dealt with it, you know, health wise and also mental health and keeping the creative energy going? Just any, you know, final thoughts as the year is ending like and what do you expect next year is going to be like how are you actually preparing yourself for the new year because we don't know right mm -hmm. what it's going to be i'm preparing myself for another year at least without live concerts i just don't think it's gonna happen uh, yeah i mean that's the reality we probably all realize that and the way things are going nobody is booking concerts nobody is planning concerts right. there are virtual stages sure but you know who's watching and not as much as people like who would come to a concert actually mm -hmm. and but I, i'm worried about what happens beyond that because we're going to lose generations who are concert goers so the typical concert goer is somebody who is newly retired really let's mm -hmm. so that generation you know if the pandemic so that this is this year next year people will be afraid to come back to the recital halls like they used to yeah there will be probably three four maybe more i mean that sounds awful but together the same audience we used to get and there will be uncultivated audiences there will be we would have skipped 
a generation of concert goers. So I think it's really important how we program. I think that it's really important that we speak about what's important to the people, what's really on the table, what they read about, and really bring those issues to music, in the music that we perform, in the music that we commission. So that's the only chance to, for me to revive art and to revive what we do again. It has to be current. It cannot be a whole year of Chopin, a whole year of Beethoven. I mean, as great as it is for us because what they left us. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to be, it's really in our hands how we shape the future of classical music because this is a reset, you know, this pandemic sort of yeah, everything, right? Mm -hmm. For all of us but in terms of creativity you know that when it started it was just really hard for me for probably all of you but my students at emory did a fundraising concert because emory was working on a um, drug to uh, therapeutic for COVID at the time so it was an experimental stage so we did a fundraising concert and we raised a thousand dollars which probably is nothing in the grant <laughs> but it felt so of course good, yes. you know just to be able to contribute and to be yeah. able to do something mm -hmm. in terms of that. Um, and then from there on, you know, you just have to think ahead. I, I'm like, I'm debating whether I should sign one concert in Vienna this summer, but I think I will just so that to have something to look forward to, even if it doesn't happen. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. But so you, you, do, you do miss that thrill being yeah. on stage yeah and, of course yeah uh, yeah yeah what do you what do you tell your students people uh, know you're actually you know preparing for careers you know so hopefully you know many of them you know when they graduate you know things will have changed but mm -hmm. as you say you know things will, will be different mm -hmm. you know, and, well uh, my students unlike yours you know um they my college students they play on a really really high level but they go on to be doctors mostly mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really grateful for that because it's a generation that will love classical music, mm -hmm. you know, and when <laughs> come for them to retire, they'll come to the concerts. Mm -hmm. But um, so in that sense, I don't have the same burden you do. I think mm -hmm. that um, they understand that what needs to be done and they do it for the students like Charlie. He's the only one auditioning. I'm just I feel I feel sad that he's not going to get the thrill to go into these great concert halls around the mm. country and live because a zoom audition is never going to be the same as a live audition in a beautiful recital hall but they all cope with it as we will all learn to cope with it and um but some better than yeah. others yeah what's your yeah. plan david anything oh, this, this, is, this is not about me <laughs> Oh, but I'm curious. <laughs> no, I think I think you know it's the it's the same. You know, on the on the more general level, you have to have some signposts in your in your immediate future. You know, you have to know you know what your what your goals are. You know, and if it's not something that that was planned that was cancelled, it needs to be something artificial that you kind of you know create. And mm -hmm. and also, I'm I'm trying to learn learn a, learn some repertoire really because i feel like that's that's a, that's a really unique opportunity i i don't think i ever was able to do, do that during a season you know when i was playing mm -hmm. concerts i would learn one thing here and there but but i would never learn a whole whole program mm -hmm. so that's nice you know on the other hand you're you're learning it but you can't really try things out you know you can play for friends you know right. you can do right. you can do run throughs for neighbors or something so so i feel a little bit less secure Mm -hmm. artistically though in that case because because uh when you play just for yourself you know it does it does get boring right. after a while you know and you don't you don't really quite know where you where you are as a, as, play for as a me on zoom no it's yeah right but it's it's it's, it's on zoom you know so i think that's kind of you know what, what elena was talking about uh the uncertainty uh will really affect us all mm -hmm. you, you know, know I, performing life it's almost it's it's the same as like sport if you will you're like conditioned to perform mm -hmm. live right? and like if you don't do it for a year like that goes mm -hmm. away right. like, no matter yeah. if you're practicing what you're doing it's kind of different you right know? You know, it, it goes back to kind of what we talked about earlier and you know, what you said about sort of you know really practicing it is athletic what we do 
you know and and getting on stage you know and trying out you know how these jumps and leaps actually work you need to be on stage mm -hmm. because a lot of what all of that you know is easier is easy in, in the practice room and you learn so much we all do you know by you know traveling and kind of discovering new places new halls new pianos uh, it's going to be much harder if we have to stream concerts from our, our living rooms for the next year. Yeah, year yeah. Ugh, so, gosh. But, you know, again, you know, maybe maybe it does give us, you know, a little bit more calm and, you know, some ability to kind of put more insight, you know, into some repertoire that we haven't really performed before, for example. Right, and the relevancy that you were talking about, Elena, yeah. I do agree. It's a, It could mm -hmm. be a good opportunity to bring in more awareness and more, you know, different kind of audience with mm. the repertoire that you cultivate and just bringing in the discussion, right? I think that's what you're trying to do. So. The only chance for us, I think, to reinvent ourselves because we can't keep presenting, you know, like, really the audience is, will appreciate contemporary music. They will appreciate any music we present, if, how, it's how we present it. It really boils Yeah, down. I agree. Yeah. If you condition a, a, like a big city to hear Beethoven 5 every year, like, of course, they're going to look for that in the subscription. But if you try and, you know, like a, a commission or like you try to look for music that is not necessarily everybody like is attuned to it or knows of it, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean people are not going to listen to it. it, it mean, so in that sense, I think that's really the future for us like we, we need to be to stay on top of what people are talking about what it what matters to people because what mattered before the pandemic won't matter after the pandemic and also what mattered before the you know the movement towards um, you know social and racial justice that that didn't necessarily exist before right so we need to we need to be on board with that and I think it's important to recognize that. It was probably there, but not like not so on the yeah. yeah, people yeah. were just not as much aware, for right. sure. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well. Elena, thank you so much for being with us. Thank it was you. a great conversation. Yeah. And I you know I always write questions and I have like four pages and we get like <laughs> the second page, but that's that's the nature of things. And I hope we'll be able to do this again. I mean, that's gonna that's gonna that's one good thing about the pandemic that this probably would have never happened two years ago because to get you know three people aligned you know, mm -hmm. with, you know our crazy schedules would have never been possible right. so i'm i'm grateful for that i'm grateful for your conversation Ji, thank you so much yeah. for being here as well, well Elena, thank, you. Thank, thank you so much again you. and yeah. we'll see all of you in the next year yeah right. maybe Happy in holidays <laughs> <laughs> bye Thank wow. you.